Friends, when the hands of the cause met during the Baji conference last October and November, we were delighted with the progress of the faith throughout the world. But there were some reservations concerning our joy when we consider the home front. You will remember that our beloved guardian, in his last letter to the American Baha'is, he spoke about the home front. That letter was dated September 21st, 1957. And he said then that if the deficiencies in the home front were not remedied, immediately that the whole plan could be mutilated and the prizes already won jeopardized. And he appealed to us not to let this one remaining opportunity be irretrievably lost. And after some consultation, the hands decided that I should come to Canada on a six-month visit. I have had four of those months and have loved every minute of them. I have found in visiting the communities in all of Western Canada and Ontario that all the way through in every community we have the most dedicated souls who are devoted to the faith and would give their very life blood for it at any time. I have no doubt this applies all throughout the United States. All these people just dying to serve the cause, but there seemed to be a feeling among many of them that they could not teach. They wanted to teach, but they had been frustrated. They just weren't able to make contact. They had found that their friends were not interested, and they couldn't keep on trying to persuade them. And I liken this feeling to a sales organization, where if a salesman goes out to sell his product day after day after day, and never makes a sale, the time soon comes when he becomes so discouraged and his morale so low that he just cannot go out anymore. It seemed to me that many of the Canadian Baha'is were feeling this way. And when we add to that the fact that Baha'is as a whole are not trained salespeople, and they are attempting to sell one of the most difficult products in the world, a religion with a strange name that nobody seems to want that it is understandable that these Canadian friends should have become discouraged and just not know how to go about selling. So in our consultations throughout Canada, in all these conferences we had in every place, we developed the theory, the idea, that there are two factors that the ordinary sales organization does not have, but that we have. And they are, first, the promised assistance of God to all those who arise to serve him. And the second is the functioning, or the proper functioning, of the local spiritual assemblies. So we took these two factors, which we have in our favor that the ordinary sales organization does not have, and develop them. And we worked out the fact that, in the first place, it seemed to me that there are many Baha'is who have an intellectual acceptance of the faith, but they don't have it in their hearts in many ways. For instance, we all know that God does assist everyone who arises to serve him. We know it because we read it in the teachings. But I think many don't believe it. 
In other words, they have it in their head, but they haven't got it in their hearts. And this is where we must get it. We must know that God does assist every one of us when we rise to serve him. Now we also know that throughout Canada and the United States, in every town, village, hamlet, city of the world, there are hundreds and hundreds of waiting souls, people waiting to know about this revelation from God. They are all around us. It is like fruit. When you go to take a fruit off a tree, there is some fruit that is ready to eat now. There's another fruit right near it that is, will be ready in a week or a month. Today it's hard, but there are some that are ripe and ready now. And there are people waiting in despair for the love of God, and we must reach those people. Those are the ones. Now, we develop the thought that God will guide us right to these people. People who are waiting for us to come to them and bring them the faith of Baha'u'llah. These are the ready, waiting souls and friends on this continent. There are millions and millions of them who as soon as they hear about the faith, they will embrace it and they will thank God that you brought it to them. We must know this in our hearts, not just in our heads. So on this basis, we went further to develop how do we make sure that we can obtain this assistance of God when we want it and that he will guide us to these waiting souls. So we spent some time on the thought that in order to obtain this assistance, we must in ourselves develop a greater intensity of devotion to the faith a real intensity of devotion. And we do this by using the prayers, by studying the word, and by going out to teach. Now, on the question of prayer, in each one of our sessions, we spent from a half an hour to an hour discussing the long obligatory prayer. It is my feeling that this is one of the most important writings of Baha'u'llah. And it seems there are so many Baha'is who never use it. I wish I had time to spend a half an hour on that prayer alone, because to me this is the key. If we will use this long obligatory prayer often, and many people are now, many Canadians are now saying it every day and finding they have tremendous support. Of course, we all know the Tablet of Ahmad and many, many other prayers. But we, we have majored on the use of the long obligatory prayer, suggesting that it be used first thing in the morning. Now, many communities decided that they would do this, that they would use the long obligatory prayer. Several said they were going to use the Tablet of Ahmad nine times a day. They were going to read some of the teachings every morning and every evening. You know, if you have a hose connected to a tap, that is running with water. That water is diffused out at the end of the hose. But if the hose is just an inch away from the tap, no water gets into the hose and the water doesn't diffuse out. It is the same with teaching the cause. If we want to teach, we must be connected with the source of the power. We must be titled right into the teachings and to the love of God. And this we do 
by developing this infinitely greater intensity of devotion. Now, friends, it is easy to make these statements. Um, I suppose we all, there's nothing new about this at all. The only thing new that I have to bring you is a little evidence of the fact that this works. We know the Bob told us this. We know that Baha'u'llah told us this. We know that Abdul Baha told us this. We know that our beloved Shoghi Effendi told us this. Now I want to add the fact that the Canadian Baha'is have also told us this, and I want to give you the, a little bit of the evidence that they have. Since we've had these meetings, I have had a real deluge of letters from Baha'is all over Canada telling me of their experiences in using these prayers and praying to be guided to the waiting souls and to be guided as to what to say when they got there. So I'm going to read you a few excerpts from some of these letters. I wish I had time. Uh, I could read for an hour or two hours alone from these letters, but I shall just read little, perhaps one sentence, out of a few letters. And my purpose in doing this is so that you will see that this is working in Canada. And perhaps you don't need this in the United States in the same way. <laughs> but if you do, it will work here too. Now the first letter, I'm going to read um, more than an excerpt of it because it is a particularly beautiful one. It is from a girl, a young girl of about my age. <laughs> what are you laughing about? <laughs> she told me the night of our meeting, she said, John, I have nobody to teach. There isn't one soul. I have no contacts. All my friends I've ever had have heard about the faith, and they will not listen anymore. I have no place to go. But she said, I'm going to try this out. I don't know whether this is right or not, but I'm going to try it. I'm really going to storm the gates of heaven and see if God won't guide me through some waiting souls. Now, here is her letter. Or here is a part of her letter. The night after our meeting, I went home and prayed very hard. I used the long obligatory prayer and several others. I had to meet new people and did not know how. Reading the paper the next morning, a small ad announced a 15-week series of drama classes. I immediately applied and was accepted, not knowing what the course entailed. The first evening found me on the floor doing physical exercises. <laughs> it was a painful procedure for these old bones, but it paid off well. Lying flat on my back, I heard a whisper from a girl. That's a fascinating ring you are wearing. Please tell me about it. <laughs> in my haste to sit up, I nearly broke every bone in my body. <laughs> But my face was shining and I was ecstatic. After class that first evening, over coffee, the message was joyfully given to ten new people. Result? In three weeks, a declaration from a wonderful soul, waiting, prepared to give her life and love to Baha'u'llah. She is on her knees, thanking God that she can bring her children up the Baha'i way. She is being accepted into the faith at Nauru's. She is moving to a larger house so she can teach. Don't stop reading. <coughs> there are more surprises. <coughs> Another student from the same class came to see me two nights ago, and after six hours of ecstatic and enthusiastic exploration of the teachings, we were on the floor with maps, books, pamphlets spread all around, suddenly said, thank God he sent you to our class. 
I have been a Baha'i all my life, and I didn't know it. He instantly declared himself. I was spellbound. I wept. My heart was bursting with exquisite joy and gratitude at the confirmations of the spirit that were being showered upon us in torrents. Two new believers in one month out of a class of ten is not a bad percentage, don't you think? But that's not all. There's a third. A colored boy who is studying, also the husband of the first friend who won't be far behind. Things are happening fast and furious around these parts. We are all stimulated and encouraged. If this isn't guidance, what is? So I would advise Baha'is to join a physical exercise class. <laughs> be sure to wear their Baha'i rings. Broken bones will bring a new believer in every time. <laughs> and she ends up, isn't this a riot at my age? <laughs> Friends, this is just one case. I have several letters like this. And this is happening. Do I need to say any more? Can I sit down now? Well, now, here's another, just one paragraph. He says, I can speak for five hours. <laughs> this is a, a letter, it is a four-page letter, but i just give you one excerpt from it. From a, a girl, she and her husband have been in this town in Canada for seven years. And they haven't brought in any believers, nor have they done any teaching for some years. Um, but they said they certainly were going to do some. And so she wrote a letter telling of her first real experience. And she said, I was saying the long obligatory prayer about an hour before I was to leave for that meeting when the strongest conviction came over me that I would tell someone about the faith that evening. I just knew I would. And she did. Another one. The prayers are bringing results for me. Had an amazing talk with my manager today. What a wonderful experience. It almost scares me. In fact, it did scare me. I rushed right upstairs and said the long obligatory prayer. <laughs> Another one from a wife whose husband had resisted the cause for some years. And in the same town, there was a wife who had resisted the cause for some years. And she wrote, we have been saying the tablet of Ahmad nine times every day along with several other prayers. On March 20th, she wrote again, this was two weeks later, to report two declarations, her husband and the wife of the other chap. And she said, I am too happy to write a sensible letter, but just had to let you know the good news. And they attribute this to the long obligatory prayer, the tab of Ahmad, nine times a day. Another one, the power of prayer was quite a revelation to me. While I knew that power, that power was there, the tremendous potency of it became clearly shown to me by this happening. The morning after our meeting, she told me later that she had decided she would try this out and she spent one solid hour in prayer. She said, I used the tablet of Ahmad, the long obligatory prayer, the prayer for Canada, other prayers, and within five hours, one of my friends quietly asked me to assist her in writing her letter declaring her wish to become a Baha'i. The confirmation of the power and assistance we get from our prayers will live forever with me. Now, here's one that is a little unusual. I must tell you about this one. You see, I am so convinced that this guidance is available, that sometimes I might be accused of perhaps being just a little over-enthusiastic. And I was at one meeting one certain Friday evening, 
and I turned to one chap who was at the meeting. I knew he was going away for the weekend, <clears throat> so I said, I said, Richard, if you pray, God will bring somebody to your door on Monday afternoon. <laughs> now, I didn't mean him to take me too literally on that, but here's his letter. After our meeting, I began to ponder over the words you had said to me. Someone will come to see you on Monday afternoon. I prayed over the weekend more than I have ever prayed before. And on Monday, I waited anxiously and very alert. <laughs> but nothing happened. I was not despondent as expected but reason that I must pray with more intensity. Lo and behold, on Tuesday afternoon. Now friends, I can't hit it right on the nose every time. <laughs> friends, we have a very unexpected and wonderful surprise for you. Our beloved hand of the cause, Bill Sears, has just arrived. We're right at Tuesday afternoon. <laughs> You'll never guess what happened. <laughs> this was another place in Ontario where this chap and his wife had been for several years and they had no contact. But on Tuesday after, it took God a little time to get going on this one. <laughs> but on Tuesday afternoon, some, a man came in and his wife, and that started their first fireside, and they came back two evenings later. That's just that. Now, another place in Ontario where there had been little teaching and where they were a little skeptical about all this, the fact that if you really prayed with this great intensity of devotion that God would guide you to somebody, this chap wrote a few days later and he said, a woman telephoned to say that she's one of a group of five who want to study the Baha'i faith. Friends, can you beat it? Do you think it works? For the first time, this letter goes on, for the first time everybody is both praying and teaching. I have never seen so many happy Baha'is before. Everybody seems to have a new sense of confidence and the effect is even noticeable in details of personal lives in some of the most wonderful ways. For myself, I just had never seen teaching the faith this way before. Friends, I had a letter from two old friends. One of them saying that his son and his daughter had declared, and another one expressing such joy that his wife had become a Baha'i after many years. And, you know, I think this may have been the result of a certain technique that I was able to bring to them from Africa. And I pass this technique on to you in the hope that perhaps you may be able to use it. This is a young African man who has done wonderful teaching in the Athelan. His wife had not been a Baha'i. In fact, she was quite hostile to the faith. But at the last convention, he told us that she had become a Baha'i. So after I asked him about her and congratulated him on the fact that his wife had come into the faith and asked how he had done it, well, he said, you know, it was, it was fairly difficult at first, but you know, the time came when my wife began to think that she would like to, to join the meetings to be a part of the group. 
You know, he said, we have meetings in our house, uh, three nights, four nights, sometimes five a week. And she thought she'd like to be, you know, come along. He said, we have a very small house. We only have one room, just a little mud hut. And of course, when she wasn't a Baha'i, um, well, I couldn't let her stay. I had to ask her to leave the house. <laughs> and she became a Baha'i during the last rainy season. <laughs> You know, in Canada, we've had, since I told this, this story, we've had a, a deluge of, of wives coming into the faith. <laughs> and some, uh, some husbands have too. Now, um, I'm glad to pass this uh, African technique on to you. <clears throat> but I do with a request that you write and tell me how it works when the first time you try it. <laughs> Now, there are so many other of these letters. One girl writes, I have been saying the tablet of Ahmad nine times every day. The main thing is I find that the people I already know seem to be drawing closer to me, and I feel so much more love for them and for everyone else I meet. Friends, I wonder if I need. Well, here's one other I, I should read. Here is a, a dear friend of mine who writes, this is a, uh, a girl, she said, I don't know that I should read this, I'm, I hesitate a little bit, she starts out by saying, um, dear John, uh, would you please go back to Africa? <laughs> you are becoming a disturbing factor in Canada. We can't keep up to those things that are resulting from our prayers. We shall have to stop praying or shall we shall become too exhausted to carry on. <laughs> the things that are happening to us are knocking us all out. This is a small community and they reported that they had had five new Baha'is in one week. So I'm going back to Africa just as soon as I can in the hope that this continues. On the question of the long obligatory prayer, I had one letter of some pages from one chap who wrote most enthusiastically about it, and from his letter I quote this. On the day following my use of the long obligatory prayer, my attitude and actual experience seem to be much different and better than on the days I failed to use it. One might say even there is a qualitative difference in the kind of day I have, and never once has this prayer let me down. Friends, there are so many things we could say, but you all know them anyway on the importance of this. Now, I think the last letter I shall read from is this one from a girl who had been a Baha'i for several years and had done very little teaching. She said, I've called myself a Baha'i for a long time, but have not been a praying Baha'i. A whole new world has opened up, indescribably more wonderful than that which opened when I first heard about the faith and accepted it intellectually. How shoddy and threadbare that seems now in comparison with this. A friend, we spoke about a friend who came, the doors opened and we talked about the faith for two hours. He had never heard of it before. He is searching, is full of questions, and is so sincere that I honestly feel ashamed and grateful combined to be alive. That night I prayed in the greatest joy until three o'clock. Friends, this is the experience in Canada. I... Goodness, what's going on here?
This is happening everywhere. I've had people telephone me, come to see me, write me many, many letters that I haven't quoted from here, suddenly saying they have come alive. And it is due to the fact that they have begun to use these prayers and especially the long obligatory prayer. It's a strange thing to me how few people seem to, to know that prayer. Now this may not apply in the United States, but in Canada, everywhere. And the reason I developed my respect for it myself was some years ago I visited a community and I came back and reported to a very close Baha'i friend of mine that there were great troubles in this community, great disunity. Well, he said they're not using the long obligatory prayer. Well, I thought this was rather a dogmatic statement. Well, I said, why do you say that? Well, he said, people who use the long obligatory prayer don't have that kind of a problem. So a year later, I went back to that community and in the course of our discussions I gave a little talk on the long obligatory prayer and some of them said where do you find that prayer they hadn't been using it and when they started a lot of their problems just seemed to dissolve and then they began to teach and it seems that in so many communities where there is active teaching people are really happy Where they don't teach, they seem to devour one another. It seems that we must, in order to win the crusade goals, and of course we are going to win them, there is no doubt of that, but we need to develop this greater intensity of devotion. I think of Mr. Banani, who was the first hand of the cause in Africa, and one whom Shoghi Effendi loved very much and praised very highly. I remember one time Mr. Banani, who is a man of great humility, a great servant, and has done tremendous work in Africa. He told us that several years before he had been appointed a hand of the cause, he was in Haifa and Shoghi Effendi pointed to a stone that was lying in front of them and he said, do you know God could activate that stone so that it could rise up and teach the cause if he wanted to. And Mr. Benani said he couldn't understand why the guardian had said that. But he said, now I know. He said, I am that stone. God has activated me so that I seem somehow to be able to do something for the cause. But literally, I am that stone. Well, that was a great encouragement to me because I have felt very stone-like myself. And I think many of us have. And it's a wonderful thing to realize that God can activate any one of us if we will just arise to serve the cause. And this applies to all of us. So friends, this is my message. We all want to teach the cause. <coughs> We all know that there are people waiting all around us, desperately waiting to embrace the cause and the love of God. And if we develop this increased intensity of devotion by using the long obligatory prayer the tablets of Alma, study the teachings, and go out in peace, we will be guided in every step we take. Allah upon.